Often in life, there are forces beyond our control that drive us toward a destiny we could never predict, bringing us to a place that tests our character, our will, our faith. Perhaps that destiny is life's most difficult challenge, but out of it comes our greatest moment. In 1980, I decided to do an exhibit on Japanese Americans in the war, and I'd been researching it for a year. And just before I opened this exhibit, a Japanese American comes up to me into my office named Clarence Matsumura. Historian Eric Saul will never forget the day Clarence Matsumura walked up to him at the National Japanese American Society of San Francisco and told him something he couldn't believe. And he says, I know you're opening up an exhibit, but you have to tell our story of how we liberated Dachau. He says, what do you mean? He says, we, we liberated the prisoners, the Jewish prisoners. We saved them from the Nazis. And I said, I never heard that. So he went running out to his car in his trunk. He had a blue album with pictures of the prisoners that he had liberated. And he had spent two days taking care of prisoners, feeding them, giving them. He said, I gave him, he gave him pancakes and, and soup. When he told me the story, he was crying. He said, I'm, you're the first person I've told this story in 47 years. Before the war, Clarence's family owned a grocery store in Hollywood, California. They were incarcerated at Hart Mountain, so he volunteered for duty and became a member of the 522nd Field Artillery Battalion, part of the highly acclaimed 442nd Regimental Combat Team, comprised solely of Nisei soldiers. It was spring of 1945. He was the very tip of the spear of American forces pushing into Germany. He had the dangerous job of a forward observer, driving ahead, finding the retreating Nazis, and reporting their position to American forces. All of a sudden, we heard shots. Immediately, you'd think that that was an encounter, so we would head towards the shots to support the firing. This is rare footage of Clarence in 1986, talking about what happened as he rolled into Dachau. The shots he's referring to are German machine guns, Nazi guards trying to kill as many Jewish inmates as possible before fleeing from the invading Americans. He had no idea that he had stumbled upon the Death March. Emaciated inmates in striped uniforms, many of them dead, others barely alive. Most of these people didn't have shoes on, and they had gone as far as they could go, and they couldn't walk anymore, so they were on the side of the road, and they were looking up at us. They marched these poor guys who hadn't eaten in days and hadn't drank, and they had they'd been worked to death. Could you imagine marching for five days, weighing 90 pounds, 80 pounds? During this march, um, almost half of the prisoners died. And you could tell every one of them was more than starved. They had been forced marched. The people that had been strong enough was scattering any time we came close. The inmates were scared. Clarence's uniform and white star in his vehicle were clearly U.S., but his face was Japanese. It was confusing for the inmates. And they were thinking that we were from Japan that had given up and had joined forces with the United States, and we were now fighting on the U.S. side. Once they realized he was American, they knew they were liberated. He started giving them all his rations, busting into German homes to find warm beds and water for them at the same time calling back to headquarters to report this shocking scene he had found. I was on a back truck when we first stopped. The first thing I was doing is I was going over there trying to help these people. Anyhow, and, you know, you're trying to take care of the people. They were just so far gone that... Uh... The Holocaust is one of the darkest chapters in human history. Clarence had seen a lot of horrible things in the war, but nothing like this inhuman cruelty. A number of times he tried to feed them, only to have them die in his arms. As he said, just too far gone. All the other veterans of the 522nd, I think, were traumatized by what they saw. After hearing Clarence's story, Eric was desperate for more information. How is it possible no one knew about the Nisei soldiers' role in such a significant moment in history? I wanted to find these Jewish prisoners and find their story. So we put an ad in the Jerusalem Post. We said, if you remember, you know, Japanese or Oriental men in the American army, and if you were in Dachau and you were liberated by them, would you please call me? I want to find you. I want to find your story. And Sally Ganor was the first person to call me. 
Shali Gnor was a Lithuanian Jew. And the Lithuanian Jews had suffered the highest casualties of any Jewish community in the entire war. 97% of the Jews of Lithuania were murdered in the four and a half years of the occupation. He has a remarkable story of how he, as a brilliant teenager who spoke five languages, survived years of hell. In this interview from 1992, he talks about the end of that death march, thousands of Jews in a clearing on the side of the road when the Germans opened fire. Sali, exhausted, hid behind a tree under a fresh blanket of snow. They started shooting, but they couldn't see anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the snow covered us, yeah. and fortunately, I mean, they were they, they were in a panic already because the American army was very near. Yeah, and uh, I just slept. I didn't bother anybody. I didn't care. And I heard bullets all around, but uh, uh, I fell asleep. He awoke the next morning to the sound of an approaching jeep. Uh, and I'm sure it was Germans, you know, and. So I closed my eyes and I thought, that's it, you know, I, w I didn't have enough time to run away. And uh, I was sure they're going to shoot me. And then I heard, uh, heard them speaking English. Mm. I didn't know what to make of these. They, they didn't look like Americans to me. It was four members of the 522nd. One of them approached him, gave him a Hershey bar, lifted him from the snow, and told him he was free, and then took him to get medical aid and food. It was Clarence. See, that was the first face I saw of that, so it made on me a An impression. tremendous impression, obviously. It was between life and death and, and sanity, insanity, and, uh, and he was the guy. And suddenly, after all that, I, I was rescued and I'm alive. And uh, it was an incredible type of emotional feeling. It was destiny, finding each other on that remarkable day in 1945, and then, a half century later, from opposite sides of the globe, they find each other again. And on May 2nd, 1992, the 47th anniversary that Clarence lifted Sally out of the snow and gave him food, they had met in the Renaissance Ramada in Jerusalem. They met, and we all started crying for a half hour. It was the most amazing experience. It was the first time Sally had cried in 47 years. And outside of Munich, about 10 miles, is the Dachau camp. This video taken the next day shows Sally and Clarence sitting next to each other, talking to the media, revealing to the world the story of how Japanese Americans helped liberate the Dachau death camps, a fact our own government would not admit for decades. Clarence passed away three years later. Afterwards, Sally gathered his notes and memories and wrote a book. Light One Candle became an international bestseller. It is one of only two books required in German high schools. The other is Anne Frank's diary. Not lost in Sally's beautiful writing is a sad irony that he was rescued from a concentration camp by a man whose own family was locked up in one in the United States of America. That oriental fence was like an angel an oriental face to them was life. They went from a moment where they were, they were gonna die after four and a half years of extreme torture, and in a moment, they were alive. They were saved by the angels of life.